waking or sleeping, I dream of boats. Usually of rather small boats under a slight press of sail. And when I think how great a part of my life has been spent dreaming the hours away, and how much of this total dream life has concerned small craft, I wonder about the state of my health. For I am told that it is not a good sign to be always voyaging into unreality, driven by imaginary breezes. I have noticed that most men, when they enter a barber's shop and must wait their turn, drop into a chair and pick up a magazine. I simply sit down and pick up the thread of my sea wanderings, which began more than fifty years ago, and has not quite ended. There is hardly a waiting room in the East that has not served as my cockpit, whether I was waiting to board a train or to see a dentist, and I'm usually still trimming the sheets when the train starts or the drill begins to whine. If a man must be obsessed by something, I suppose a boat is as good as anything, perhaps a bit better than most. A small sailing craft is not only beautiful, it is seductive and full of strange promise and a hint of trouble. If it happens to be an auxiliary cruising boat, it is without question the most compact and ingenious arrangement for living ever devised by the restless mind of man. A home that is stable without being stationary, shaped less like a box than like a fish or a bird or a girl and in which the homeowner can remove his daily affairs as far from shore as he has the nerve to take them, close hauled or running free, parlour, bedroom, bath, suspended and alive. Men who ache all over for tidiness and compactness in their lives often find relief for their pain in the cabin of a thirty-foot sailboat at anchor in a sheltered cove. Here the sprawling panoply of the home is compressed in orderly miniature and liquid delirium, suspended between the bottom of the sea and the top of the sky, ready to move on in the morning by the miracle of canvas and the witchcraft of rope. It is small wonder that men hold boats in the secret places of their minds, almost from the cradle to the grave. Along with my dream of boats has gone the ownership of boats, a long succession of them upon the surface of the sea, many of them makeshift and crank. Since childhood I have managed to have some sort of sailing craft and to raise a sail in fear. Now, in my seventies, I still own a boat, still raise my sail in fear in answer to the summons of the unforgiving sea. Why does the sea attract me in the way it does? Whence comes this compulsion to hoist a sail, actually, or in a dream? My first encounter with the sea was a case of hate at first sight. I was taken, at the age of four, to a bathing beach in New Rochelle. Everything about the experience frightened and repelled me. The taste of salt in my mouth, the foul chill of the wooden bathhouse, the littered sand, the stench of the tide flats. I came away hating and fearing the sea, and later I found that what I feared and hated, I now feared and loved. I returned to the sea of necessity because it would support a boat, and although I knew little about boats, I could not get them out of my thoughts. I became a pelagic boy. The sea became my unspoken challenge. The wind, the tide, the fog, the ledge, the bell, the gull that cried help, the never-ending threat of the bluff of weather. And once having permitted the wind to enter the belly of my sail, I was not able to quit the helm. It was as though I had seized hold of a high-tension wire and could not let go. I liked to sail alone. The sea was the same as a girl to me. I did not want anyone else along. Lacking instruction, I invented ways of getting things done and usually ended up by doing them in a rather queer fashion, and so did not learn to sail properly and still can't sail well, although I've been at it all my life. I was twenty before I discovered that charts existed. All my navigation up to that time was done with the wariness and ignorance of the early explorers. I was thirty before I learned to hang a coiled halyard on the cleat the way it should be done.
Until then, I simply coiled it down the deck and dumped the coil. <laughs> I was always in trouble and always returned, seeking more trouble. Sailing became a compulsion. There lay the boat, swinging at her mooring. There blew the wind. I had no choice but to go. My earliest boats were so small that when the wind failed, or when I failed, I could switch to manual control. I could paddle or row her. But then I graduated to boats that only the wind was strong enough to move. When I first dropped off my mooring in such a boat, I was an hour getting up the nerve to cast off my pennant. Even now, with a thousand little voyages notched into my belt, I still feel that the boat will be on shore and cast it off as the gulls jeer and the empty mainsail claps. Of late years, I've noticed that my sailing has increasingly become a compulsive activity rather than a simple source of pleasure. There lies the boat, there blows the morning breeze. It is a point of honour now to go. I am like an alcoholic who cannot put his bottle out of his life. With me, I cannot not sail. Yet I know well enough that I have lost touch with the wind, and in fact do not like the wind anymore. It jiggles me up, the wind does. And what I really love are windless days when all is at peace. There is a great question in my mind of whether a man who is against the wind should longer try to sail a boat. But this is an intellectual response. The old yearning is still with me, belonging to the past and to youth, and I am torn between the past and the present, <laughs> a common disease in later life. When does a man quit the sea? How dizzy, how bumbling must it be? Does he quit while he's ahead? Or wait until he makes some major mistake like falling over or being flattened by an accidental child. This past winter I spent hours arguing the question with myself and finally deciding that I'd come to the end of the road. I wrote a note to the boatyard putting my boat up for sale. I said I was coming off the water but as I typed that sentence I doubted that I meant a word of it. If no buyer turns up, I know what will happen. I will instruct the yard to put her in again, just till somebody comes along. And then there will be the old uneasiness, the old uncertainty, as the mild southeast breeze ruffles the cove, a gentle, steady morning breeze bringing the taint of the distant wet world, the smell that takes a man back to the very beginnings of time, linking him to all that's gone before. There will lie the sloop, there will blow the wind, once more I will get underway, and as I reach across the red mound off the Torrey Islands, dodging the trap boys and the toggles, the shags gathered on the ledge will note my passage. There goes the old boy again, they will say, one more rounding of his little horn, one more conquest of his roaring forties, and with the tiller in my hand, I'll feel again the wind imparting life to a boat, the smell again of the old menace, the one that imparts life to me, the cruel beauty of the salt world, the barnacle's tiny knives, the sharp spine of the urchin, the stinger of the sun jelly, and the claw of the crab.